Greeting, stranger. A new dawn has come, and with it, a new journey. Before the sun has reached its zenith today, I will be boarding a ship for the next tour. Last night's frenzied analysis of every country in the inner sea region certainly helped matters, though I admit the benefits were more subconscious than not, seeing as I do not remember much. Powerful stuff, Blood Eye Coffee. Anyway, I have decided first to recount the lore of one more creature from our ever-faithful bestiary, the Encyclopaedia Galarianensis, before I leave. I have selected the Basilisk, for it is a magical being of considerable infamy and thus also misconception. And misconception has been the bane of many a brave adventurer questing across Galarian. So, sit yourself down one more time here, and let me tell you about these green-eyed reptiles. I promise this information could save your life one day, or indeed extend it. But first things first. A typical basilisk resembles an overgrown lizard in many ways, and a fully grown adult specimen can reach a length of 15 feet. They are scaled, tailed, and possess a long, forked tongue that they use to taste the air for their prey. Their mouths are also packed with long, sharp fangs, incapable of delivering modest bites. Their leathery skin comes in many colours, ranging from mottled grey to verdant green, and it is always well camouflaged for the diversity of environments in which you can expect to encounter them. For basilisks are hardy beasts, and they make their dwelling places everywhere from dark caves to lush jungles. There are few places on Galarian where they cannot be found. What's more, while they are typically solitary creatures, they may be found in pairs during mating season, and on occasion can even be found congregating into packs of up to six. I have even heard tell of some hidden nooks and forgotten valleys, where swarms of dozens upon dozens of the things crawl along every surface and set themselves relentlessly onto any who discovers them, though precisely when, where, and why they behave in this manner is beyond my knowledge. Basilisks are considered reptiles, meaning, among other things, that they are cold-blooded and lay eggs, and this alone has seemingly been enough for the masses to dub them the Kings of the Serpents. However, any similarities end there, for the remainder of the basilisk is unlike any snake known to me. Firstly, they possess a hardened, spine-like structure that runs down the lengths of their backs, extending even to the tips of their tails. These vertebrae afford basilisks impressive protection from careless blows, and are also the only things that may be discerned above a row of hedges or field of grass before a swift end follows. Secondly, basilisks possess no fewer than eight short but deceptively powerful legs that assist them greatly in slinking hither and thither through the foliage-dense environments they prefer. And finally, the utterly unique eyes of a basilisk are unforgettable, should you survive the opportunity of meeting the gaze of a pair. Described sometimes as the twin points of emerald death, and sometimes, somewhat less metaphorically, as flickering flames of green, they are overpowering to behold. Basilisk eyes have no pupils and no irises, only a subtly shifting, ever alluring bright green sclera that can turn flesh into stone. Yes, indeed, petrification is at the basilisk's beck and call, and the hypnotic appeal of meeting its gaze is usually the last mistake a victim will have the chance to make. By channeling its will through the link established by the mutual meeting of vision, a basilisk can transmute the flesh of almost any living creature into hard rock. They have evolved this incredible power, apparently, so that they can be lazy, for the basilisk is by nature a slow, lethargic being, utterly unperturbed by all save the most violent of threats. By petrifying its prey, therefore, it prevents it from retreating, resting, or resisting, and preserves the meat better than any human seller could. Naturally, basilisks prefer to consume stone flesh, for their stomachs are filled with powerful acids that can undo the effects of their gaze and digest the resulting meal though this process still takes many days. This means the basilisks, once fed, can survive without meals for many weeks, and they often spend this time reflecting pensively on the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. 
only joking. They spend it basking in the sun's warmth, or cooling off in the shade of their lairs, which are invariably well stocked with suspicious looking chunks of stone. Now powerful as it is, the petrifying gaze of a basilisk does have its limitations. Most importantly, its range is quite limited. It can affect creatures within 10 yards or so. So yes, this does mean you can gaze in wonder into a basilisk's eyes without turning to stone yourself, if you do so from a safe distance. And yes, this has been tried before in a zoo in Absalom. And no, it did not end well. A second limitation, or perhaps qualification, to this power is that it is an active force, not an involuntary passive process. A basilisk must concentrate its gaze onto a target to challenge its fortitude with its will, and therefore beholding its eyes, even from within range, is perfectly safe so long as it remains unaware of your presence. A basilisk could theoretically be trained not to petrify a very brave handler, but I have personally never seen this accomplished. Thirdly, this petrification can only occur if the gaze is mutually experienced, meaning the blind are immune. An enraged basilisk can stare as intensely as it likes into unseeing eyes, but no effect will be achieved by doing so. Do be warned, though, that basilisks have excellent dark vision, so the cover of night is no hindrance to it, though it might be of benefit to you if the sunset shields your own sight. Finally, I should note that, for reasons no one can quite understand, all weasels and ferrets are completely immune to their glares, so polymorphy into one is always a handy escape option if you find yourself cornered and otherwise unprepared. Curing petrification is a difficult process. The simplest method is to find a spellcaster capable of transmuting stone into flesh, though individuals powerful enough to wield such magic are rare, and they usually charge dearly for their services. Lesser magicians could channel the appropriate spell through a scroll, but you would still need to purchase the scroll, and it is likely to cost 300 gold or more. A greater salve of anti-paralysis is also capable of removing petrification, but this item is almost 10% more expensive again. And do keep in mind, no matter what course you take or solution you engineer, the restored body will not regain any chewed off body parts without even greater restorative magics. So while the many limitations to a basilisk's petrification may seem to make it a trivial danger, the consequences of succumbing to its gaze are severe indeed. You have been warned. On the other hand, there is a secret way of restoring petrified flesh, one that alchemists seldom admit. I happen to know that the blood of a basilisk is paradoxically anathema to its own glare. It is not certain what benefit this brings to it, because contrary to what one might expect, a basilisk is not in fact immune from petrification itself. Nevertheless, its blood, so long as it is freshly harvested, will release the rocky prison of any one of its victims. Strangely, this will not work on beings that have been petrified for other reasons, so it is a very circumstantial boon. Yet a boon it remains, especially to the adventuring party whose valiant leader was reduced to a statue in the defense of his companions. Not that I speak from personal experience, of course. Now, as with many magical beasts of this world, the basilisk has a variant that is typically relegated to the caverns of the Darklands below us, or at least to cave systems and other lightless places where most fear to tread. While only half the size of a regular specimen, the subspecies known in lore as the Crimson Basilisk is actually considered more dangerous. This is a doubly impressive assessment once you learn that Crimson Basilisks are not able to petrify others with their gaze. Instead, these scurrying creatures open wounds from within a person's body, causing rapid and uncontrolled bleeding from their eyes, nose, ears, and mouth. Once weakened by the horror and trauma of such an assault, the Crimson Basilisks of the Darklands close the distance quickly to strike with their acidic jaws. On account of their more dangerous bite, increased speed, and capacity to fly into a period of unabated aggression towards all other living things, the Crimson Basilisk has proven itself to be more than a match for many Darklands wanderers. I advise you well. 
avoid them. But perhaps the most dangerous variant of the basilisk is not actually a true basilisk at all. Sometime in the distant past, basilisks discovered that they were capable of crossbreeding with dragons, and the results of these unions were the hybrids that we today call the Draculisks. These frightening entities possess the flight, breath, and pride of the true dragons, as well as the eight limbs, leathery hides, and petrifying eyes of the true basilisks. They are altogether more ferocious than their lesser kin, and they come in all the colours of the chromatic dragons, as it seems that they are the only ones tolerant enough to mate with basilisks. Yet even among these lineages, black seems to be the most common by a wide margin, suggesting that the wickedly evil black dragons of Galarian's swamps are, for some reason, the most fond of mating with basilisks. Luckily for us, Draculisks are relatively uncommon creatures, even when compared to the crimson basilisks of the Darklands. Still, I do not envy the fates of those with the misfortune of encountering one on their travels. Remember that the principal advantages we hold over regular basilisks are our relative speed, intelligence, and agility. But Draculisks compensate for almost all of these, for they are fast through the skies, more agile than most, and they even possess a degree of tremor sense to protect them from ambushes, not to mention the draconic resistance to energy blessed upon them. The silver lining to this is that their intelligence remains animalistic and instinctual, significantly stunted compared to the overpowering wills of the true dragons, so a draculisk can be outsmarted. And we should thank our gods every day for this weakness, for otherwise we would need to compete with a flying, smart, hardy creature capable of petrifying us in mere moments at a glance. I, for one, would rather avoid overseeing the creation of such a beast. Well, stranger, there are the basilisks. Sluggish and dim, yes, yet nevertheless utterly terrifying, to say nothing of the draculisks that sometimes stalk our civilized lands. I will leave you with this final tidbit of information to leverage however you will. Petrification is not fatal by itself. On the contrary, it is completely reversible. The danger of being petrified by a basilisk is not so much that you will be turned to stone, more that you are likely to be eaten before anyone can summon the powers necessary to turn your body back to flesh. Yet if you were a crafty individual, you might perceive that spending long periods of time as a statue might have its advantages for seeing the long ages of this world unfettered from the demands of time. Sure, you may miss the boring years as an unaging statue, but imagine waking up still youthful to a brave new world filled with advances in technology and magic beyond your contemporaries' comprehension. I do wonder how many garden decorations are waiting for someone to release them and experience that very scenario. Just a thought. Now, I must finally leave this place and board a ship. Do you want to know where I'm headed? Ah, well, why don't you meet me on the same pier that we left yesterday in about an hour and find out. I promise that there will be plenty of lore where we're going. Well, until then. <laughs>